Hello. We are going now to talk a little bit about the third part of this uh, short course regarding power metallurgy for beginners. In the previous, in the previous lectures, we talked about the general things regarding the technology, what is powder metallurgy, fields of applications, advantages, disadvantages, and so. In the second lecture, we talk about the historical background, just to have a feeling about what the history has contributed to big, to, engrow, to, to, to enlarge this technology during the centuries, till, till we reach the, the, the situation today. And now, today, we are working to talk about the TM process. How is the, the TM process in general terms? So if we can describe the general process, at the beginning, the first way to produce TM parts was starting to the base powders. That those powders should be mixed usually with lubricants and other additives. Sometimes in the mixing process, we mix all the elemental powders that can contribute to produce the alloy. Then once we have the mixed, pow the mixed powders ready, we can press it. We can reach then the green part. The green part is used to have enough green strength to be manipulated in order to move the parts from the press to the sintering furnace. Then we have the sintering process in which we reach the sintered part. And after the part is finished, after sintering, usually many times is the, the part is ready to be sent to the customer. But many other times we have to do some post sintering treatments in order to have the final part. So the first step is to have powders, metallic, metallic powders. It's not, it's not easy because metals are ductile materials. So usually by crushing or by, 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 by milling, it's not easy to, to get uh, this kind of powder. Later, we will talk a little bit about this. But there is a lot of different process to get uh, to get the, the metallic powders. One are the chemical methods, and from those, one important one is the electrolysis. By electrolytical uh, process, we can reach very uh, fine powders with a good chemical composition, without impurities, and usually with this dendritic morphology. Morphology in powders is also an important issue. So this every different uh, powder production method should produce different morphologies also. So in that case, electrolytical powder used to be the dendritics. There is another method, which is the another chemical one, which is the carbonyl process. By, by the composition of carbonyl, metallic carbonyls, we can reach metallic powders. In this case, the one of the advantages of this powder is what also the purity, the, the chemical composition is quite uh, very good. And uh, in this case, uh, we have fully spherical powders, as you can see in this microstructure, this is for nickel powders. So chemical carbonyl process used to have is to, is to be used to, uh, to produce fine powders with high purity and with a spherical shape. Then we have another chemical methods. One of the most uh, important is the sponge iron process in the, 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 the reduction process. And in the, in the case of the iron, it's quite important because the, there is a lot of tons in the per year that water which are produced by this method. In this uh, method, what we mix is the one uh, iron ore, which is a, a, an oxide. We mix this iron ore with uh, coke, which is a carbon provider uh, salt. Um, after a long way through a, a channel in a tunnel in a tunnel furnace we produce in solid state the reduction of the iron ore into sponge iron. Uh, this powder is, uh, is produced by a chemical reaction in between the, the coke, which is carbon, with the iron oxide. And um, of course, we have to add some, uh, some materials that can be helped to, to melt the, some of the, 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 the materials that can be developed during the process. And at the end, you have a, a, an irregular powder with a lot of internal porosity. Um, in general, this powder has a lot of uh, surface, surf, a lot of surface, so the surface energy is quite high. And this powder is suitable to, to produce part by press and sintering. We have the, let's say, physical methods, and the most important one is the melt atomization. And you can atomize both 
in different kind of fluids. Uh, one important is water. Water, we can produce a lot of different powders by water atomization. Uh, what we do here is to melt the, the metal. And once we have melted the metal, we atomize it, uh, producing an, a big screening of the, of, the, of the droplets. And these droplets are rapidly solidified by contact with water in this case. In this case, in water atomized, we used to produce uh, irregular powders, not, not fully irregular, it's quite rounded powders, but not fully spherical, like we saw in the case of the, of the carbonyl, carbonyl method. So this, from these uh, materials, we can prepare the powder in different ways in order to go to the pressing step. We can mix powders uh, from the iron. In the case of the steels, usually the, the main material in the feedstock to, 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 the, to the pressing is the iron powder. And we can admix these powders with other alloying elements, such as copper, nickel, or, or moly. And then we can mix and then go to the, to the, to the pressing step. Of course, we can atomize the materials with the, all the alloying elements, and we can produce the so-called pre-alloyed powders in which we don't need to mix with any other alloying element. We can mix it with carbon or lubricants, but not with another alloying elements. And even you can, we can combine the two techniques. We can combine pre-alloyed powders with other uh, alloying elements to produce diffusion alloyed powders or hybrid or, or to produce a bonding with some kind of polymers to, to increase the processability for the pressing step. We can also atomize by gas. By gas atomization, we use instead water, uh, a gas, in order to atomize the melted, melted droplets, the melted droplets uh, produced by atomization. And in this case, the, uh, the advantage or the difference between water atomizing and, met, and gas atomizing used to be the size of the powder. Usually, by gas atomization, we have a much better uh, control of the chemical composition. We don't have oxidation in principle. We can protect much better this material. So for some material which are really uh, with a high affinity for the oxygen, it, this, this is a much better process than the water atomized. And at the end, we have a fully rounded, a fully spherical particle similar to the, similar to the uh, carbonyl iron in, in terms of the rounded, roundness of the of the particles, as you can see here in this uh, transparency. So at the end, you can have different size, shapes, and prices depending of the of the processing method. But the, one of the good things of powder metallurgy is that the different methods to produce powder can give us a completely different, uh, let's say, portfolio of alloys or, and size and shapes. And you can choose each one for one different application. So it could be interesting to have such a kind of, the, of different possibilities. So after you have the powders ready to press, you can go to for the pressing step. The most cheap way to produce PM parts is by uniaxial pressing. In uniaxial pressing, you have a die in which you put the powders and you have an upper punch and a, and a lower punch, and you can apply the press by simple effect from the top to the bottom, or if you, want, if you want to eliminate or reduce the dissimilarities in between the part due to the different densities that you can have that you can have inside the part due to the fact that you are applying the pressure from the top, you can go to double effect uniaxial pressing in which you apply the pressure from the bottom and from the top. And at the end, you have a more similar density in between all the, all the internal parts of the, of, the, of the press, of the green part, of the press part that we used to call in powder metallurgy green part. Of course, in the, in the real life, you can complicate as much as possible the, 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 pressing, the pressing step, uh, establishing different levels for, the, for each level of the part in order to apply different pressures in the different uh, sections of the part in order to make more uniform, make more uniform the final density of the green part, and in this way to avoid cracking during the sintering due to the different shrinkage or, or different uh, swelling of the internal parts of the green part. 
So in that case, we can have different kind of presses and different kind of uh, multiple uh, FX uh, pressing systems. So here we have uh, one small video of the, comp of the full cycle of the, of the pressing. You have first you introduce the powder in the dye, then you remove the powder that you don't need it, then you press, and then you extract the part, uh, pulling up, the, pulling up the, the green part from the bottom to the, to the surface. So, um, sintering is the next step, and the sintering process depends a lot from the kind of powder that you, that you have used, and depends a lot of the green state of the part, and depends a lot of the pressing process. So at the end, after pressing, you have a porous material, and after sinter, you reduce a lot the amount of porosity. Uh, here we have an example of how could be the view of the material in the pressing stage, in which you have, the, this is for one steel, in which you have the, same, the, iron, the iron powders and the halogen element powders, and after sintering, you promote the diffusion of the halogen elements through the iron-based powder, and you have this aspect in the microstructure. At the end, you have a porous material due that the presence in the method is not, is not uh, with this method, you can reach never a full density. It's very difficult to, to, to reach full density. Usually, uh, are used continuous furnace. Bell furnace is the most typical uh, the, is the most is the most typical furnace for conventional sinter parts. Here you have different areas or zones or in the furnace. At the beginning, you have the wax, the waxing area in which you remove the wax that, that or the lubricant that were introduced in the mixing pro, in the mixing process in order to improve the pressing capability of this powder. Then you have the sintering area in which you reach the highest level of temperature. Uh, in this part of the, of the furnace in order to, to produce the sintering process. And at the end, you have a cooling, re, a cooling area in which even today you can produce some kinds of uh, heat treatments in order if, you, if this cooling is, uh, is helped by water, by water jackets, you can, you can cool down very quickly and you can have the so-called, uh, you can, can have some kind of quenching at the end of the furnace. But usually, the, in the sintering, you cool down at very low speed, and at the end, you have something similar to an anneal uh, part. But uh, another interesting thing is to consider that usually the belts are stainless steel belts that can be deteriorated during the time, and you have to replace the belt time to time. So you can also use batch uh, process, not continuous process. In this uh, vacuum or with gas, uh, you can sinter in a more control, in a more control way. You can maintain different steps in the sintering process because you don't have here a continuous belt, and you can program the, the sintering process in steps. And these steps can allow to you even to put different gases or different atmospheres in each part of the sintering process. So by presence as Sinter were developed a lot of parts in the, in the industry, especially for the automotive industry. The first part was produced in 1937 and it was uh, pumped all year and it was manufactured by General Motors. It's what is a really easy part, which uh, is, a, is a gear, which is very difficult. It's not difficult, it's much more expensive if you do it by, by machining. And it was really a success, this part, and it was the first one in the industry. After that, it was developed. It was developed a lot of different parts. Here we have some examples. This is a valve seat, a valve seat insert. It was developed uh, to Volkswagen, and of course, uh, it was very quick uh, developed uh, from from the first uh, from the first moment. After the gear and after the seat valve, it was developed a lot of uh, bearings the, uh, and another another another. A lot of different uh, interesting part. One is one very interesting is the main bearing cap. The main bearing cap is uh, is really a, a relatively large uh, size uh, part with a lot of powder involved, and it was uh, a really important improvement for the industry to develop this such a kind of part. 
so today it was you have a lot of parts in the different parts of the of the of the car in the engine in the steering in the steering system in the transmission system and many others here we can see some of those this is for the car transmission you have the synchronization hub the synchronization ring the gear level a lot of you see a lot of different parts with different complexity this is for the car steering also the shock, shock approach this is another very typical part the shock absorber piston and this on the valve seats and the shock absorber all the all the system in the shock absorber are, are developed by father metallurgy this is for the engine exhaust manifold flanges rocker arms uh, this is some injection pump timing pulleys pulleys etc of course the, the oil pump gears that were developed uh, from the beginning this is also for the engine this, the, 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 the previous dimension the bearing caps you can develop also the pm logs for the camshaft some kinds of pulleys and so there's a lot of different parts this is quite interesting the connecting road connecting road can be manufactured by casting by simple forging by forging but also by pm usually by double press and sinter method press sinter and then press again and sinter again double press over sinter and, and others here you have other parts in the for instance one example is in the different small small engines you can have electrical engines inside the car that can move different systems like the windscreen wiper drivers or the sunroof mechanism and so so till now we have seen the let's say the cheap way to produce pm parts but this cheap way allows to us to have a porous material with enough mechanical properties to fulfill the requirements of the system in which this part is located but you can also to follow the so-called high performance route in which at the end you have near full density in the in the parts so that means that the properties of those parts are much higher than the conventional press and sintering uh, manufacturing method so in this case you start also with the powders from the powders and you can go for, by this route and by this route to produce uh, by cholecystatic pressing, which is another way to press the, the part, and by hot extrusion of forging, at the end you have full density material. Another way by hot pressing or spar plasma sintering or hot isostatic pressing or additive technologies or even, even metal injection molding in which the final density could be in the order of 96, 98% of the theoretical one. All of those methods uh, reach at the end a part with near full density and after heat treatments you can reach a really high performance material later in the last lecture we will talk a little, a little bit about this let's go through some of those methods sinterforging for instance sinterforging is is quite interesting because uh, you follow a similar route than the conventional present sinter method but what we do is just after sintering when you have the part at high temperature you forge it and in that case at the end and after the heat treatment you have a near full density material because you are applying forging at high temperature when the, the when the ductility of the material is really high and you can deform it strongly in order to reach this uh, this uh, full density material in this case, in Sinter forging, you have the advantages of the present Sinter method in terms of the complexity and in terms of the, you have all the advantages to, to, the, to one technology that starts from powder in terms of uh, crystal size and, uh, and control of the, or control of the microstructure or control the, the, the chemical composition. And at the end, you have also the advantages of the forging methods in order to get full density material. Here you have one part produced by Sinter for you one year. And one typical, typical PM part produced by Sinter for you is the cone rod. In that case, uh, the, the density of the cone rod is quite near full density. And this material is like a forged cone rod, but with much with other extra advantages from the fact that you have a start from powders. The hot isotic pressing uh, method. Is, uh, is a way in which you have to can and encapsulate uh, the powder and you apply it over this can, the a pressure 
in a, I mean, it's just the way because you apply the pressure through a gas. Usually this gas, uh, the, the most extended gas used here is the argon, which is a he heavy gas that can be used to, trans to, transport the, to transport the pressure to the can and to the powder. And uh, of course, this method is also developed inside the furnace in, at high temperature. So that means that the ductility of the can and the ductility of the powders allows to reach this full density thanks to the pressure and the temperature that we apply simultaneously. Uh, hot exhaust pressing is used for many, many different applications, of course, to produce semi products uh, from powders in mass production. But also, is used hot exhaust pressing to eliminate residual porosity of parts produced by different methods. Sometimes powder metallurgy methods like metal injection molding or additive manufacturing, but other times from casting or forging. It can be produced also for welding the similar material with gradient uh, fusion. There is a lot of applications in this, in this sense. And of course, to repair parts after long life use and to prevent fatigue uh, failures. In the heat process, we used to use uh, gas atomized powders. These gas atomized powders are are uh, put in a container. Uh, we usually it's a can, a metallic can, and we have to eliminate by vacuum the gas, the gas in the, the gas that has, can be trapped inside this can before to go to the horse that pressing equipment. This is the one, some photographs regarding to the canning. One way to reduce the price of these materials is to enlarge the size of the cans and the, and the presses. As much uh, bigger is the this can, we can reduce, we can uh, we can enlarge the pro enlarge enlarge the production, and we can reduce the price. And this this uh, forced to us to build big presses in which we can put those big cans inside. So this is one of the largest in the world in which uh, we can produce a can of 1.6 meter meters in diameter and 2.3 meters in, in height. That means at the end you have a big ingot of material, hot isostatic pressing. Usually, one of the drawbacks of the hot isostatic pressing is that the cycle to reach a full dense material without any defect is a little bit large. Usually, you need in the order of four or five hours to reach uh, these final properties. And in other, in, on, the other, on the other hand, the, one of the advantages is that the pressure is not, is not to be so high than in uniaxial pressing. Uniaxial pressing, in order to reach a good value of green density, is in the order of 700 megapascals. When you apply temperature and pressure at the same time, the pressure usually is not so high, in, in the order of 80 or 100 megapascals. But on the other side, the temperature could reach very high levels. It's not in, even, even for ceramics or for a special material, can be reached in the order of 2,000 degrees. So the, here we have some examples of metallic materials produced by hot isotopic pressing. One, this is a malagene steel just for aerospace. This is a typical comparison in between press and sintering and, and hot isotopic pressing. As you see in hot isotopic pressing, you don't have any porosity. You have full less material. Here is the conventional press and sinter style steel, but on the other side, the grain size growth um, in a considerable way because you don't have the restrictions of the porosity that usually helps to avoid the grain growth during the sintering. Here, you don't have any porosity that can, let's say, uh, maintain the, 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 the grain size uh, in, in some specific uh, value. And also, the fact that you need mm, different hours, many hours to produce the, pre, the, the, final, the final material, you produce a, usually a, a good, interesting or negative grain growth. One application which is typical in, for, for hot isotope pressing is the high speed steels. High speed steels at the end, you can reach a very nice material in terms of density, a full density material with, with a very good distribution of the carbides. And this material, used to be much better than this one that is produced by conventional forging, in which you have higher carbides with higher level of the size of the carbides and with the directionality in the pressing direction, in the forging direction. And we don't have such an isotropy in the hospital depressing material in which you have a full, a very good, uh, 
anisotropy in the properties. Here we have some other examples. We mentioned before that you can use the hot isotopic pressing to, to weld dissimilar materials. This is one example. Or you can produce especially superalloys, cobalt based superalloys for, uh, for uh, bio, bio applications, cemented carbides. You have a lot of different possibilities with cemented carbides, superalloys, this for aerospace, and so the, another way to produce to have full density is hot pressing, in which you apply pressure and temperature simultaneously, but in, in this case, uh, in uniaxial way. Uh, you can do it including all the pressing system in a furnace, or you can do it applying the temperature by a current going through the powder by Joule effect. In that case, if we go to a pulse uh, current, uh, application, we have the so-called spark plasma sintering, in which you apply the sintering, the, te the sintering temperature through a pulse co current supplying through the powder in the process. Applying pressure and temperature, at the end you have full density here, and this material usually can compete today with the host of pressing uh, materials. The negative thing is that you can produce uh, complex shapes, usually you have blanks, that should be machined machine, machine later in order to have the final part. And other interesting method, of course, is powder injection molding. In powder injection molding, we use the injection molding capability of the plastics uh, to inject a complex part through injection. But in this case, what we do is to mix uh, metallic or ceramic or composite powders with the binder system with different kinds of polymers. We have to produce it uh, by mixing usually at the temperature in which some of, the, of these polymers or, to, or those polymers are melted, we produce the fixed torque by pellet, pelletization, pellet, pelletizing, and then we go to an injection machine and we have all the advantages of the plastic injection molding to produce very complex uh, parts. At the end of this injection step, we have the so-called green part, but here, this is a, in fact a composite of a binder, a polymer binder system with a metallic uh, powder. So in order to have at the end the metallic part, we have to eliminate the binder by different ways. And one typical one, one typical is the, the thermal dividing. And after that, we have a, a brown part without uh, good uh, density. And we have to sinter at the end to have the final part. By meta injection molding, we can develop many, many different applications and materials. The, maybe the, the, the worst restriction for meta injection molding is the size of the part that could be not so large in order to allow the, the binding process in, the, in one of the steps of the process, which is the binding. Today, another way to produce materials by powder metallurgy is the so called. Uh, additive manufacturing methods. In, in, in powder metallurgy, in, in metals, we have in principle three different systems for additive manufacturing. One is the powder bed systems in which you have the powder in this, in this, in this bed, a bed of powders. Uh, you can uh, melt in the surface. You can construct the shape that you are wanting to, 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 to develop by, in, in 3D by a beam of laser or a beam of, uh, of uh, ions or any other kind of beams, but high, with high energy, you can melt in the surface and you can construct the 3D part by moving by a retractable platform, this bed of powder that can grow from the top to the bottom. Another way to produce uh, three, three dimension parts by, by ID manufacturing with powders is the so-called powder fit systems. In that case, you can fit the powder by different hoppers. In this case, it's not uh, drawing in this, in this transparency, but you can, uh, you can put here under the beam of the laser, different elemental powders, and you can develop the alloy by mixing elemental powder. This is the the advantage from the powder bed system. In powder bed system, the powder here must be a fully pre alloyed powder with some specific uh, characteristics of roundness and uh, flowability and etc. even melting of these powders. But here, you can miss different powders to reach the final part. And the third system is the so-called binder removal methods in which you really uh, print 
a 3D a 3D part by painting, but what you are you are what you are constructing is a is a is a part with the polymer that you you must eliminate before the sintering process. It's in a similar way than in a metal injection molding parts. So in this way, you can develop different parts for different industries. Today, you have a lot of application in biomedical applications, but also in filters. When you have to develop a highly porosity material with a complex shape, the additive manufacturing methods are quite suitable for that. So we have, over, we have made an overview of different PM methods. And if you have any question, you can address to me by email. And please uh, follow the next uh, lecture that will be devoted to the methods to, to improve the performance, the, the properties in the PM material. And thank you very much for your attention.